I'm Brenna Campbell, and I'm here in the San Gabriel Mountains to show you some of the cool things that you might miss if you're walking too fast. Let's go on a tiny hike. I'm scouring the banks of a stream to find one of California's most iconic cold-blooded creatures. Look at this grumpy little face. This is the California Newt, Tarika Tarosa. I'm not handling him right now because he has a very powerful toxic skin. He's poisonous. It's a tetratotoxin, which is similar to what you would find in uh, puffer fish in the ocean. They get their moisture through their skin, so it's very easy for them to dry out, but they can also rehydrate very quickly. He starts out completely aquatic with little gills that you can see it as little frills. And they're much smaller, and he becomes this size that you see here. You're gonna find them probably at the bottom of waterfalls, under rocks, basically just hiding out anywhere they can get quick access to water. So we're gonna put this little guy back into his little home. He's grouchy. Come on, little guy. One of the coolest things about the California Newt is that you can see every stage of its life cycle if you spend a little extra time looking. So we're further down the stream now on the Arroyo Seco, and we found the nymph form of the California Newt, Tarika Tarosa. Unlike tadpoles, these guys are kind of almost fully formed when they're a nymph. They're just aquatic instead of terrestrial. So they already have their little tiny arms, they already have, you know, that little mouth. And one of the ways that you can tell the difference if you're looking into a stream is that the tadpoles kind of have a solid color and these little newt nymphs have two vertical stripes down their backs. So these little nymphs and tadpoles have a very hard time growing up because they're very small and a lot of things like to eat them. And we're talking insects like the water scorpion, arachnids like the long-jawed orb weaver, birds, even other frogs and toads, garter snakes, Everything loves to make a meal out of these guys. All right, let's put this guy back. There he goes. You might think that the Pigeons up here on the telephone wire are your standard domesticated pigeon, but they're actually a wild species called the North American band-tailed pigeon, and they are the largest species in North America. They're the closest living relative of the passenger pigeon, and they have a similar diet to what it would have had. They are frugivores, so they eat uh, your berries, your fruits, and they're also important uh, acorn eaters, which means that they are critical for spreading oak forests. So they have these kind of reddish eyes, and one of the other markers that you can tell it's a band tail and not your domestic pigeon is it's got a little white band on the back of its neck, and then right below that band is a beautiful little patch of green iridescent feathers. They travel in very large flocks, so similar to the passenger pigeon, it's possible that they'll one day fulfill the ecological niche that the passenger pigeon used to fulfill. The passenger pigeon may be gone, but we can still appreciate their incredible relatives here in the San Gabriel Mountains.
So here we have a great looking little tadpole. These guys are very, very common in this part of the river. It's possible he'll turn into a little Baja California tree frog. It's also possible that he could be some kind of toad. It's very hard to tell at this age. You'd need a microscope to really figure it out. So tadpoles are in shallow streams, usually in sunny areas, because they are algae eaters, and they only become insectivores when they turn into frogs. Um, a lot of these guys might get left behind as tadpoles, because if there's overcrowding in a puddle or a small creek, they will stress each other out and it kind of prolongs their metamorphosis into a frog. These guys are also amphibians, just like the newts and the salamanders, and so that means that they're water permeable. They're just totally aquatic. They kind of replace fish in this ecosystem, and they're just very cute. Catching amphibians, try to put them back as close to where you found them as possible because you never know what their territories are like. Let's go a little further down the river and see what these tadpoles are going to turn into. Three. So, this is the Baja California tree frog, and it's a very cute, tiny little endemic frog. And that's what you'll see most of the tadpoles in this river turning into. In various stages. They are a little bit differently camouflaged to the tadpoles, so they're more equipped to jump around in terrestrial areas, and they have little sticky pads on the bottom of their feet that enable them to kind of cling to vertical surfaces. This one looks a little bit skinny. He might not be eating as much as he wants, or it's possible that he's got some kind of little parasite, because they're, they're in the wild and that's what happens. I could have stayed here and admired this guy for hours, but he had other plans. So I've just caught a damselfly nymph in the same kind of part of the stream that you would find things like the uh, tadpoles and the California newt nymphs, and it is a cool little insect. It also has a larval form like the frogs and the newts. It is a little predator, and it will predate on smaller tadpoles, and it will eventually grow up to become a damselfly. Now, I wanted to show you this because it highlights a concept called convergent evolution, which is an interesting thing that happens with different species, and it's that they will evolve very similar traits separately in order to fulfill a similar niche in the environment. Now, tadpoles, California newt nymphs, and these damselfly nymphs have all evolved the same kind of coloration, so it makes them very hard to distinguish from each other if you're looking at it from above. And the reason for that is that they've all evolved to match their substrate. So they're matching these sandy banks of these shallow creeks. They're matching, you know, they can be darker in rocky areas. They're basically just trying to hide in the same zones. I'm walking down the stream, and I hear a crashing sound coming down the mountain. I look a little bit closer, and I see something that would make most people hightail it out of there, but I couldn't be more excited. So this is a rattlesnake, and it looks like it's just caught a rat. He's hesitating. He was biting it before. He's hesitating because they are actually very shy, and he's worried that I'm going to come up and try to hurt him. So. We'll give him some nice space. These rattlesnakes will always give you a warning before they strike, so they'll have that signature rattling sound. They're a docile species. You shouldn't be too alarmed by these rattlesnakes. One of the really interesting things about the Southern Pacific rattlesnake is that it's been found that their venom varies widely in a very short range. So you might encounter one Southern Pacific rattlesnake that has a venom that affects the blood, and then an hour away there might be another one where their venom affects the muscles. I step off the rock I'm on to let this guy go about his business, and there is another surprise on the ground right in front of me. Here is a second rattlesnake. It is just a baby. It's very tiny. But, you know, they are as potent as adults. So we will give him some space and we'll head on out of here.
So right above me is a Cooper's Hawk, and it's just a fledgling. So this is just a guy who's just learned how to fly. One of the ways that you can tell it's a Cooper's Hawk and not a different species like a red tail is that they have gray and black bands on their tail. And they also have kind of a white chest with little brown feather speckling. The Cooper's Hawk is a bird of prey, so that means it's kind of one of the higher up predators in this area. So we're talking about it eating ground squirrels, it's eating mice, it's eating rats, maybe even snakes and lizards. This guy is just a little baby right now and it looks like he's crying out for his mom to feed him, but I bet she's trying to teach him now how to hunt on his own. Without these awesome birds, we would have so many rats and mice in this area. We would be overrun, so they are a, an important part of this ecosystem. This is just a very cool predatory bird, and it's really exciting to see one so close. When they're adults, you pretty much just see them as a little speck in the sky, but it's really great to see one this low on the tree. Looks like this guy is tired of waiting for his mother, and he's going to go find food on his own. We're headed to a muddy riparian zone. I know there are some great micro-ecosystems in these places, so it's time to put down my field notes, lift up some rocks, and see what I can find. So this is the black-bellied slender salamander, and it is a beautiful tiny species that you could go your whole life in the San Gabriel Mountains and never see this guy, but if you know where to look, they're pretty easy to find. They only get a couple of centimeters long. They're also amphibians, like the California newt. Very little is known about them or what they eat. They are amphibians, so they need a lot of moisture and you'll find them in places that have kind of a nutrient-rich mud. They don't go through a life cycle like the California newt. They just hatch fully formed out of their eggs, and I can't imagine them even having a larval form because they are very, very tiny. They're only a couple of centimeters long. And this little guy, it's possible he predates on springtails, mites, maybe isopod babies, but uh, this guy couldn't wrap his mouth around an ant. This salamander's cousin, the California slender salamander, has the ability to create a secretion that adheres to a snake's mouth and glue it shut for up to 48 hours. Now, if you find yourself handling salamanders in the wild, make sure there's nothing on your hands because they have very sensitive, absorbent skin. So let's just put this guy back where he belongs. As I'm leaving the mountains for the day, I happen to be at the right place at the right time to catch a glimpse of a creature you almost never see above the ground. So what we're looking at here is a gopher. They are a very shy species of rodent. They don't, you don't really see them out much. They're, they live their whole lives underground. You can tell he's a rodent by those big, big front incisors. They always have two big front incisors, and those are for eating grasses and stuff. Those incisors will never stop growing throughout his entire life, so he's got to chew on things to keep them worn down. They're known for being pests in some people's gardens, but out here it's just great to see one. These guys have to be very cautious because there are a lot of things that will predate on them. Like coyotes, bobcats, even big birds of prey like that Cooper's hawk. I find these guys hilarious. They're really funny. They're just super cute. I'm going to let this guy stuff his cheeks in peace while I head back to civilization for my own lunch. After just a few hours in the San Gabriel Mountains, I was able to find so many amazing creatures. Just imagine what you might find if you take a little extra time on your next tiny hike. Mm -hmm.